Central Illinois. Prairies dotted with small towns stretch off toward the horizon. It's a tranquil setting. And yet in the 1970s, hundreds of locals saw something ominous in the broad skies above. They call them Thunderbirds. In years to come, still more of these giant birds are observed soaring over Alaska, Illinois, and Texas. But what are they? 500 years before modern day residents saw them, the ancient Indians who lived here had identified the creature in their legends and folklore. There are two types of Thunderbird stories that I have identified. The helpful Thunderbird and the dangerous Thunderbird. Western Europeans stumbled across this more dangerous version of the Thunderbird in 1673 during their first exploration of the Middle Mississippi River. Near the Illinois River, the expedition discovered 40 to 50 foot petroglyphs of a monstrous beast gouged into the cliff wall. Jesuit priest Jacques Marquette described what he saw in his journal. We saw two painted monsters, which at first made us afraid, and upon which the boldest savages dare not long rest their eyes. These birds were just absolutely jet black. Exceptionally strong hind limbs, very, very sharp talons. They say eight feet tall, more or less, about one third the size of a, of a telephone pole. Their feathers would have been more like five feet long. I've never seen a bird that was quite this large. That's just scary. That's real scary thought about seeing something else like that again. That's, that's real scary. Most contemporary eyewitnesses describe a dark feathered bird with a hooked beak and a 15 to 25 foot wingspan. If accurate, these descriptions indicate that whatever this creature is, it is up to five times larger than the biggest indigenous bird in Illinois. But there is conclusive scientific evidence that a bird almost exactly like the one witnesses describe once existed. We have parts of the skull, we have parts of the legs, we have parts of the wing bones. It was so exceptional. In 1980, the partial skeleton of a teratorn, a giant ancient bird, was unearthed in La Pampa, Argentina. Paleontologist Kenneth Campbell, an expert on teratorns, flew to Argentina and identified the fossil. He called it Argentavis magnificens. In life, this bird would have been approximately this tall when standing on the ground. So it could have looked me right straight in the eye. Argentavis was six to eight million years old. It weighed approximately 165 pounds and boasted a wingspan of 20 to 26 feet. Their feathers would have been more like five feet long. Like the beaks of eagles, condors, and other predatory birds, the long beaks of Argentavis and other teratorns are hooked. Most likely, these monsters could swallow prey the size of a small rabbit whole. Birds that are related to teratorns are the New World vultures, such as the condor, or the turkey vulture, the black vulture. We know this because the bones are very similar uh, to one another, although they, they have their own distinctive trademarks. And yet, teratorns dwarf these birds in size. This is the humerus, which is the bone, your upper arm bone. And this is the humerus of Argentavis compared with that of a living California condor. Argentavis wasn't the only wing giant. In 1972, the fossil of a pterosaur or flying reptile was found in Texas. It was named Quetzalcoatlus, after the feathered serpent Aztec god. With a wingspan of 40 feet, it was the largest flying reptile ever found. 
Experts say pterosaurs went extinct more than 65 million years ago. The last pterodactyl died more than 8 million years ago. But did they? Danville, Illinois, 1972. 17-year-old John Walker is hunting doves with a friend. It's a bright summer day, about noon. Suddenly, Walker is startled by a strange sound. It basically sounded as if there was an animal caught in a trap. Do you hear that? Yeah. And there was absolutely no mistaking what we saw. It was just basically soaring. It wasn't flapping its wings. Come on. If it was some small eagle or a hawk, I mean, we would not have been the least bit afraid. It was something like we'd never seen. Come on, man. The shoulder going from here down to where the tail feathers would normally be, I calculated it between five and six feet. It's gone. No one's going to believe it anyway. Walker made this drawing of the creature he observed that day. The wing was very square, and uh, uh, the outer feathers of the bird at the very ends of the feathers were very scary looking, as I recall. Walker describes a massive bird, remarkably similar to the pteratorn. It's not with beyond the realm of possibility that some of these gigantic winged creatures may have evolved or adapted into our modern time. Cryptozoologist Ken Gerhard has researched the long history of giant bird sightings from the past and present. Gerhard has found hundreds of reports of these birds across the nation. Like Illinois and Alaska, Texas experienced a rash of sightings of giant birds in the 1970s. The peak years seem to be uh, 1976 and the latter part of 1975, where in a span of about three weeks, dozens of people here in the valley reported seeing this gigantic winged creature. Gearhart and other cryptozoologists believe that the sheer number of bird sightings indicate there is a modern-day species of giant bird out there. But the scientific community is not so sure. What greater cap could an ornithologist have in his career than to say, I discovered and described one of these creatures. It would be the holy grail, and yet it isn't happening. Dr. Pat Redding studies birds of prey, or raptors. This designation includes today's eagles, condors, and vultures. But as much as he might like to discover a living missing link between the extinct pteratorn and today's raptors, Redding is skeptical. I would need to see either a live bird in hand or the carcass of a dead bird. So far, no one has found either, despite hundreds of alleged giant bird sightings. But in 1977, a man who claimed to have seen one of these monsters also captured it on film. Could this piece of decades-old silent film be the proof that scientists like Reddick need? Lake Shelbyville, Illinois, 1977. Like others in town, John Huffer has heard about sightings of the big birds. Back in 1977, there was many, many sightings of these giant Cherokee Thunderbirds flying around central Illinois. Every newspaper, every television station was trying to get pictures of these two giant birds. Huffer is a stringer for the local CBS affiliate, so he has a camera. And because he is part Cherokee, he thinks he has a better shot than most at tracking the animal. As we came up on a bay close to the railroad bridge near Point Six on Lake Shelbyville, I looked in the back of the bay and there was a big old dead snag of a tree and there was these two huge birds at 10 o'clock in the morning roosted there. These birds were just absolutely jet black. They had huge necks and their heads were like old cracked leather. They were clacking to each other with their beaks as they were taking off and then they flew around and circled over us as I was shooting footage. After the birds fly off, Huffer returns to the TV station. 
They air his footage, and it is instantly controversial. Officials from the Department of Conservation insist that the birds on film are merely turkey vultures. But many believers dispute this, contending that this bird is far bigger than any known turkey vulture. Now, 30 years later, these scientists will review the footage and try to answer the question, is this bird the missing link to the Territorn, or something else entirely? I'm intrigued, I would have to say. I'm impressed. I, I can't explain. I have no idea what this bird actually is. In 1836, Illinois writer John Russell published a story about a horrifying winged, flesh-eating creature that terrorized for centuries the Illini tribe of Native Americans. Russell said that according to Illini legend, the monster was known as Piazza, or the bird that eats men, and that its cave on the Illinois River was littered with piles of human bones. And ever since its publication, giant birds have been reported soaring in the skies above. This footage could be proof of them. More than three decades after it was filmed, Three scientists have agreed to analyze John Huffer's film of giant birds over Lake Shelbyville. Could this image be a living Territorn, an ancient giant bird with a wingspan up to 26 feet, long thought to be extinct? Dr. Mike Wallace at the Zoological Society of San Diego has been studying endangered California condors for over 29 years. You can see the silver lining of their, of their secondaries, the leading edge as dark as it should be. There's just no doubt it's a turkey vulture. Dr. David Hancock is a historian and eagle biologist at the Hancock Wildlife Research Center. There's a shot of um, a turkey vulture soaring. Now this is a different bird. This is another turkey vulture by the looks of it, but a different bird, totally different, because the, the, the wing molting is in a different stage. But Dr. Patrick Reddick, the director of the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota, is less certain. It looks very much larger than an eagle. It looks very much larger than a turkey vulture or a black vulture. Uh, I would have to say that it uh, appears to me to be on the proportions of a, um, of a condor. We have to um, acknowledge that uh, a very large and uh, exceptionally large undescribed bird was captured on this film. Even among experts, there is no consensus. Does the truth about giant bird sightings lie? somehow in how people process what they see. October 16th, 2002. The skies over Manakotuk, Alaska. Southeastern Alaska has been flooded with reports of creature sightings. The press has dubbed them super-sized birds. That bird was at least uh, about 1,200 feet up in the air, and, and those ravens look so tiny up there flying around. It. The length of a, you know, super cup, small plane. Commercial pilot John Booker has heard these reports and is skeptical. But when he looks out the window of his Cessna 207, 600 feet above the ground, he sees something he's never seen before flying alongside his plane caught my attention because it was quite a bit bigger than a regular eagle I've ever seen. And it wasn't a bald eagle, I know that. And I noticed the bird was bronze colored in appearance and he had a beak that kind of had a curve to it, kind of a hook. Booger claims the bird's wingspan was similar to a Cessna 207, approximately 14 feet. One wingtip would be out to the end of the wing and the other wingtip would be to the root of the wing. Critics say that what Booker saw was most likely a stellar sea eagle, 
which can have wingspans of up to eight feet. Although indigenous to Asia, stellar eagles have been spotted in Alaska, but according to Booker, It wasn't a stellar. I don't think it was a stellar. It was too big to be a stellar. Flying at an altitude of 600 feet, Booker estimates the bird he saw was 500 feet away. Just how accurate is an eyewitness judgment of size at that height and distance? And the size of an object does not only depend on the size of the image or on the retina, but it also depends on the distance of the object from the observer and the context within which that object is viewed. Hussein Boyaja researches perspective at the University of Minnesota. So if you perceive the object to be further away from you, say 100 meters, but actually the object is just 10 meters away, you're going to think that the object is much bigger than it really is. This means that if Booker was wrong about the distance, if the bird he saw was not 500 feet away, but 100, he is likely to have overestimated its size. It also means that the scientists who reviewed the Lake Shelbyville footage could not have given an accurate assessment of the bird's size without knowing how far away it was from the camera. This effect is exaggerated if there are no visual markers to help reference the object. In case of objects in the sky, there are no uh, reference frames. There are no other objects around it against which you can try to estimate the size or distance of the object. So instead of seeing a giant bird flying at a high altitude, eyewitnesses could have seen a smaller bird flying much lower. This expert agrees. Without a reference, I don't believe an individual can judge the size of a bird flying. To test this assertion, Boyaja will work with Cliff Quinn, the American Kite Association's 2005 champion kite builder, for a simple experiment on perspective. There were many factors involved in the design of this particular kite. I wanted the frame to flex just as the condor's wings would flex. The bird kite will measure 24 feet, wingtip to wingtip. According to Quinn, it is the world's largest bird kite. When this kite is flying up 500 feet in the air, it will, it will definitely look like a, uh, a giant condor. But getting a kite this size airborne presents several challenges. This is an extremely long span of framing and it had to be reinforced because when this bird is in flight, there is a tremendous amount of wind pressure on the sail area or the wing area. Controlling the massive kite could also be a problem. Beneath the wings of this kite, I have included what's called a keel. It's a place where I can attach my flying line, and it also is part of the steering system. Quinn's kite and the professional flyers who will be handling it will soon be put to the test. After several attempts to get the enormous kite in the air, it is finally flying. Soaring 300 feet above a small lake. With nothing nearby as a solid reference point. Passers-by are stopped and asked if they can judge the size of the kite from wingtip to wingtip. 18 feet. That bird's at least 100 feet wide. I thought for sure that it was a very, very large eagle. I was guessing between 30 and 35 feet. And I'm going with 27 and a half feet, which I'm pretty sure is the right guess. <laughs> After polling more than a dozen people, Boyaja and Quinn have proven one thing. On this day, nobody was able to accurately judge the size of the kite. The demonstration shows that people have trouble judging size from a distance without points of reference. But what if eyewitnesses see a giant bird and visual markers they can compare it against? 
1995, Brownsville, Texas, 4.30 a.m. Guadalupe Cantu is delivering newspapers. Suddenly, his brother-in-law tells him to stop. Perched on a telephone pole just off the road in front of their car sits a giant bird. I saw really like a giant ancient vulture or eagle, some predator uh, bird. Most of it was black. It looked like, a, like it had stooped up shoulders real high. I saw it turning this way and it had a curved beak. Because the bird is sitting on the pole, Guadalupe believes he can make an approximate estimate of the creature's size. And this bird stood about eight feet tall, more or less, about one third the size of a, of a telephone pole. It had an, an enormous wingspan, anywhere from 15 to 25 feet. Uh, you take like a condor or the eagles that you see in flight, this bird's about five times bigger than that. Guadalupe Cantu identified a bird that most closely resembles the extinct Teratorn. And if Cantu's sighting isn't easily explained away using perspective, the case of a small boy in Lawndale, Illinois, is even more perplexing. It had a 15-foot wingspan on it. I mean, it was huge. Although they can look fearsome, Native American Thunderbirds are generally considered to be benevolent spirits. Images of them have adorned everything from ceremonial clothing to grave sites. You have these Indian mounds, effigy mounds around. A lot of them are in the shape of falcons. And some people say those falcons represent the thunder beings. But the oral histories of some tribes, such as the Hichiti in modern-day Georgia and the Kwakutl in British Columbia, included menacing corporeal giant birds that snatched and ate humans. And native tribes in South America also spoke of giant flying man-eaters. In 1603, the Pima Indians told Spanish explorers that they had killed a giant flying monster by building a fire at the mouth of its cave and asphyxiating it inside. The bones of another giant flying monster, similarly killed, were said to have been found by General Don Hernando Cortes during the pacification of Mexico and sent to Spain. Today, known birds of prey like eagles, turkey vultures, and condors feed on the flesh of small mammals. Many of us feel that it probably Thunderbird was, was the golden eagle. It's a very, very powerful animal, and there's lots of other legends around it. Uh, possibly the, the, the California condor was the, the Thunderbird. Some of them are what we call sit and wait hunters. They'll just assume a perch on a high observatory and look for prey that is found on the ground. Others uh, will soar uh, over long distances looking for food and can, will take prey in the air. But if eyewitnesses are correct, and there are giant birds living and hunting today in North America, what is their prey of choice? Lawndale, Illinois, July 25th, 1977. I was in my backyard one day playing hide and seek with a couple friends of mine, Willie and Travis. Marlon Lowe is 10 years old and weighs about 60 pounds. Five, one thousand, six, one thousand, seven, one thousand, eight, one thousand, nine, one thousand, ten. Ready or not, here I come. And, uh, I run around the house. Suddenly, something descends upon him from above. Something just swooped down and grabbed me. I didn't, I didn't hear it, didn't smell it, didn't see nothing coming. <laughs> so I looked up, and I seen a big old bird. According to Lowe, the bird uses its long, curved talons to grasp the sleeves of his tank top and lift him at least a foot into the air. Marlon's mother, Ruth, sees the attack from the house. Oh, my mom, she took off at me when she seen it. She took off running at me. Marlon struggles to free himself. Already, the bird has carried him a distance of nearly 40 feet. And it dropped me, and when it dropped me, I just took off running. 
Marlin and four other witnesses watch, stunned, as the bird flies off. Oh my God! And then uh, it flew up in this tree right here, tried to land in the tree right here. And it was too, too much weight, so they just took off flying on out of the tree and headed for the creek. Marlon Lowe's mother files a report with the sheriff's deputy and a county conservation officer. He tells her that her son has been attacked by a turkey vulture. Not satisfied, Ruth Lowe researches large birds at the public library and concludes that the perpetrator was similar to a California condor. But it looked kind of like a condor because it had a white ring and it was black. Marlon Lowe and his mother describe a coal black bird with a white ring around its neck, a body as big as a man's, and a wingspan of more than 15 feet in length. I'm quite skeptical about that observation. Dr. Mike Wallace at the Zoological Society of San Diego has been studying endangered California condors for over 29 years. Our condors need the mountains or steep canyons, deep canyons like in the Grand Canyon, in order to create vectors, currents, or what we call thermals, for them to ride on and to gain altitude. Out on the plains and way out in, in the heartland of, of the U.S., um, you're never going to see a condor. He is familiar with the low account. Well, it sounds like what he's describing with a white ring around his neck would not be the California condor, but an Andean condor. The Andean condor is the largest known flying creature alive today. And natives of South America have long told stories of condors swooping down and snatching newborns. But while the visual identification matches, Wallace says there's a major problem with this theory. It would be, I would have to say, impossible for an Andean condor to lift something with its feet. Uh, Andeans, as well as the California condor you see behind me, they have feet much like a turkey that can't grasp or lift. Patrick Reddick of the Raptor Center says that only a raptor like a hawk or an eagle would attack with its feet. If we say, for instance, look at the bald eagle or the golden eagle, those typical birds here in North America, but most notably is that they have extremely strong feet that are uh, tipped with very long, curved, powerful talons for gripping prey. X-ray analysis of the talons of vultures and eagles reveals a huge difference in the grasping ability of each bird. In the eagle, you can appreciate the relative heft and size of these bones here and compare that to the very slender nature of the bones here on the turkey vulture, the very large talon here, the comparatively smaller claw on the end of the turkey vulture's foot. While a raptor, like an eagle, can lift its prey, that's not the same thing as lifting a 10-year-old child. For an eagle to be able to carry, say, an eight-pound cat, that eagle would probably have to weigh on the order of 16, 18, 20 pounds. And so it would take a very large eagle, among the largest eagles that we know exist in North America, even to be able to carry a, um, a cat. Another issue, according to these experts, it is exceptionally rare for raptors to attack humans. The only circumstance that I could imagine um, an eagle actually attacking a human being is that that eagle was raised by people, what we call imprinted on the wrong species. It's so comfortable with humans that it could be very upset. But this scientist says there is one species of raptor that has been known to attack primates. When they make a kill, the kill usually takes place very quickly. There's a very, very vicious strike that uh, the, a raptor comes down, hits the animal very suddenly, very violently. Scott McGraw is associate professor of anthropology and primatology at Ohio State University. In 1998, he traveled to Africa to the Thai rainforest of the Ivory Coast. Here he studied more than 600 bones from modern day monkeys collected from underneath the nests of African crowned eagles. His conclusion, that these eagles prey regularly on small primates. And if that's true, it's reasonable to expect that early hominids were also pursued by large raptors three to five million years ago. With its taste for primate flesh, could the crowned eagle have been the bird that attacked Marlon Lowe?
based upon what I've heard, I know that they are capable of killing at least small humans. In recent decades, North America has been captivated and baffled by stories of giant bird sightings. But man's fascination with these creatures, whether real or mythic, is nothing new. Since ancient times, authors have written about giant birds, some of them man-eaters. Two stories and tales from the Arabian Nights relate Sinbad's encounters with the rock, a massive bird said to be capable of carrying off elephants. Hercules tangled with and conquered man-eaters known as the Stymphalian birds. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's fantasy adventure novel, The Lost World. Different cultures, different eras. It suggests mankind has a common fear of things that fly. But why? Dr. Greg Bambinek is a psychiatrist and wildlife biologist. He believes that humans may be hard-coded to fear large birds because they once hunted our pre-human ancestors. Part of it is, is genetic memory or the collective unconscious that those things above us that have a large wingspan can just come from anywhere. But is there proof? One man's study in Africa may yield it. In my mind, there's no problem with some type of crowned hawk, eagle-like bird preying upon human ancestors three to five million years ago. Scott McGraw sifted through the bones of hundreds of monkeys found under the nests of African crowned eagles. In 2006, he announced his findings. That these eagles were regularly killing monkeys as big as 20 pounds. From that finding, he theorizes, Large, airborne, carnivorous, meat-eating birds have been a selective force in primate evolution, most likely for as long as there had been primates. As further proof, he and other scientists point to the skeleton of a very young predecessor to Homo sapiens, discovered in a lime quarry in Tong, South Africa, in 1924. Based upon what we know, the damage that they leave on the skulls of their prey today, we can use that to interpret the past, which is where this Tong child comes in. Experts noted that the Tong child, a three to four year old human ancestor known as Australopithecus africanus, had unique markings in its skull. For decades, these holes were interpreted as proof that the child was killed by a leopard or saber-toothed cat. But in January of 2006, paleoanthropologists announced that the Tong child had been killed by a single blow, a 14 centimeter long talon that pierced the brain. The evidence? Small punctures and keyhole slots inside the eye sockets had been created when the eagle used its beak to eat out the child's eyes and brain. Modern African crowned eagles are known to attack primates weighing as much as 24 pounds, at least as much as the Tong child. And markings in the eye sockets of the Tong child are identical to markings Scott McGraw found in monkey skulls he examined. These are photographs of the uh, original Tong fossil. The outline here shows the, the broken edge of the orbital floor in the Tong fossil. And this is the broken edge of the orbital floor in a monkey from the Thai forest. We know this was killed by a crowned eagle. Based upon the similarity in damage, we believe that the Tong child was killed by a, either a crowned eagle or something very similar. But do crowned eagles hunt modern man? There are reports from, from various localities in Africa that crowned eagles have preyed upon humans. Um, there are reports in East Africa. I think a seven-year-old child was nearly killed in Zambia. Uh, there is a story that a, a, a juvenile human skull was found in a nest of a crowned eagle in Zimbabwe. I believe these, these individuals were believed to have weighed something around 15 or 20 pounds. A raptor attack is a particularly gruesome way to meet one's end. A 
raptor comes down, hits the animal very suddenly, very violently. The uh, chest cavity and the abdominal cavity are opened up quickly and the organs are, are ripped out. And the eyes and face are, are processed as well. Could it have been an African crowned eagle that grabbed 10 year old Marlon Lowe in 1977? And if so, how did it get from Africa to Danville, Illinois? Some Native Americans said it was a benevolent spirit. Others said it terrorized their tribes, snatching villagers and flying off with them. This man drew a picture of what he saw. This man says it was as big as a small plane. This man used a telephone pole as a size reference. And this man, Marlon Lowe, says that when he was 10 years old, a giant bird plucked him from the ground and tried to fly off with him. It had a 15-foot wingspan on it. I mean, it was huge. But the only bird of prey known to feed on human flesh is the African crowned eagle. Could this raptor have attacked Marlon Lowe in Illinois in 1977? I'm HDN meteorologist Dr. Joe Sobel. Dr. Joe Sobel is a forensic meteorologist who studies the impact of weather systems. He says birds often follow the rising currents of air just ahead of thunderstorms. Well, thunderstorms, of course, are the result of rapidly rising air currents. Birds will catch that rising current of air and travel along with the thunderstorm. Sobel thinks the Native American Thunderbird legend may have come from this behavior. A year after year and episode after episode, the birds would be seen flying the updrafts in front of a thunderstorm, and then following that would come the thunder and the lightning and the wind and the rain. Sobel says storms have been known to alter the flight paths of migratory birds. And although the crowned eagle is not a migratory bird, theoretically it is possible for a bird to travel long distances if caught up in a large storm. There may be another explanation for the cluster of sightings in the 1970s, an ocean atmospheric phenomenon. Now, interestingly enough, in the late 70s, in fact, in 1977-78, there was a strong El Nino. An El Nino can cause directional changes in prevailing trade winds along with their intensity. If they were to come up from South America through Central America, could easily get diverted by this subtropical jet stream, perhaps a little farther east than they normally would. Even so, the geographic obstacles presented by a transcontinental trip make such a journey unlikely even for a powerful African crowned eagle. And according to Scott McGraw, even if that bird did manage to find itself in Illinois, it's extremely unlikely that Marlon Lowe was snatched up by one. The eagle tends to rip the, the limbs off what's left of the monkey and sort of cache pieces up in the trees and take pieces drumsticks, if you will, back to the nest, um, sort of piecemeal. So this notion of a large raptor sort of carrying an intact primate, you know, a heavy primate, back to the nest simply isn't true. According to experts, eagles can only carry about half their body weight. In order for a bird to pick up and carry a 65-pound boy, it would certainly have to be a very large bird. So we're talking uh, 150, 160 pound bird. According to Marlon Lowe's description, that is what he saw, a massive bird the size of a man with at least a 15 foot wingspan. It looked like a condor, but behaved like a raptor. But no living bird has been identified that fits this description. Is there a remote corner of the world that could harbor a giant bird with a 15 to 20 foot wingspan? And if a giant species does exist, could it remain undetected 
They depend upon moving around. They depend upon being aerial. They would be seen and having to expose themselves to being seen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a bird of prey. They have to go out and find things. In fact, previously unknown species are discovered all the time. In 2002, several new primate species were discovered in the Amazon rainforest. And in 2004, a new bird species was discovered on one of the Philippine islands. Also, experts concede that however unlikely, it is possible that a single freak aberration of a known species may exist somewhere. Every once in a while, there'll be some genetic problem, a, a mutation of some kind that will trigger something that an individual creature uh, will get huge. I mean, there are several huge people, there are several huge steers, and he, that happens on occasion. So um, giganticism among individuals is, is rare, but it does on occasion happen. So what happened to Marlon Lowe? The odds are against the existence of a previously unknown species or a single freak of nature. Instead, the most likely explanation is that Lowe was knocked off his feet by a known bird, probably a large raptor. 70 pounds is far past the carrying capacity of any North American bird. That does not mean it couldn't jump and move an object that was 40 or 50 pounds. Many a bird could move an object that is 40 or 50 pounds. Doesn't mean it can lift it, however. Up close, a raptor's five to seven foot wingspan, combined with grabbing talons, would have been powerful and frightening. As he has for 30 years, however, Marlon Lowe insists that he was picked up and carried by a bird too big to be an eagle or a turkey vulture. Well, I'm sorry to say, it did happen to me. History proves that giant birds did live at one time. The sheer number of contemporary sightings indicates that people have seen, or believe they have seen, something ominous in the skies above. I was just happy to make it to the car safely without being attacked. I struck one for the Cherokee people, and I filmed a living legend. But I remember everything every day to the T, you know. I remember what happened to me. I had nightmares for a long time there. There are possibly hundreds of these Thunderbird sightings on record in modern times. We cannot totally ignore the possibility that they do exist. But at this time, science does not support the probability that giant birds exist in the modern world. To find a new species uh, in the, the heartland of the United States is, is pretty improbable. That would be very exciting to notice something that isn't in the, in the guidebooks. Until there is hard evidence, native storyteller Duke Attucks suggests this. So there's all kinds of stuff we believe in that doesn't have any scientific proof behind it. Uh, why not monsters? Why not thunderbirds? Why not uh, uh, the incredible? Thank you.